are some of your musical influences? <coughs> Ray Charles. I think um, Elvis, really, when I was very young. Very, very young. I hardly remember him. Uh, and uh, after that, it was, then, it was then all the bands that were happening at the same time. The Doors, you know, Jim Morrison was a fantastic uh, writer. I thought he was really, you know, really strong. Um, Dylan, you know. I thought Dylan musically was fantastic too. Although people only rate him as a writer and a, you know, as a, a poet. Um, then, when we were in the elbow room, I was getting all kinds of influences through jazz. Jazz like Jimmy McGriff and, and uh, great organists, because the organ started to come in popular then, you know? Steve bought the Hammond, the first Hammond C3 little organ with the pedals. And then organs really became very strong. Traffic had a very strong organ sound, you know? The old Hammond. Um, any kind of music, really. I was into all kinds of things, you know. It, 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 the, only, the only music, the kind of stuff that I, I didn't really connect with it was something that I knew was blatantly um, written, you know, for just a pure commercial aspect and didn't have anything really, um, didn't have anything to say or didn't have any really strong melody or rhythm. I used to base a lot on rhythm, you know. Not only being a drummer, but you know, uh, if for me it's, it's dead simple. You know, if a band or a record, or if if they can play, and I don't mean playing the notes, but play the feel. Like Dr. John last night, I mean, he was rocking the whole place on one piano, and everyone was really, you know, it was rhythm. You know, he's got feel. He's got rhythm. There's some million bands around, you know, that uh, play, but they don't really. You know when you've been moved rhythmically because there's nothing you can do about it. It's a natural response. If it's really happening, it's a fantastic power, you know. But that was, that was mainly what I used to go for, was when something really got me rhythmic, like Richie Haven, some of his early stuff. They used conga drums and Paul Williams on acoustic guitar, and they used to get such a, an incredible rhythm going. You were just, you know, you just had to get involved. And I think today, you know, there's a lot of mechanical sounding stuff, which is okay if you know what to do with it. I think Trevor Horn is a great exponent of uh, the art of noise, you know, just really getting all that's there technically and making it say something of value, you know. It's so easy to to just, you know, make a, a, a mechanical kind of noise. <laughs> it's even easier today, you know. We could probably make a record with you next week and have a hit if you've got the right producer, you know, right, you know. It seems to me like now anyone can do more or less anything, but there's a big l uh, lack of, of, um, of bands and artists that you can really follow and build and, and grow with them, you know, through a career. They're either in for a year or two, or maybe a month or two, you know. There's very few. <clears throat> I think the police are the most important band that's come out of England in the last 15 years, you know. Why is that? Simply because they're brilliant, you know. They're br three brilliant musicians. Brilliant drummer, Steve, um, Stuart Copeland. Sting is an incredible bass player. Besides a fantastic singer, writer, his lyrics, his songs are great. And Andy Summers, who's no spring chicken, is a great guitar player. He actually plays non-solos, you know, and he doesn't actually solo all over the place, but he just puts such great sounds together. I think it's the most magic three-piece I've heard since Cream, you know, or the Jimi Hendrix experience. I mean, they would have been great in the early 70s, 60s, you know, they would, they would have been recognized as a great band, you know. And Dire Straits, possibly, Mark Knopfler. The rest I, I, I take as what I call light entertainment, you know. You call it Georges? Yeah, you know. I, 
I mean, I can't get serious. I mean. No, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that because uh, I hope he would never hear me saying that, but I, I wouldn't seriously buy the record and put it in my collection and actually put it on a record player and sit back in my house and, and, and want to listen to it, you know what I mean? Uh, I only buy... I would buy John Waite's Missing You. That knocked my socks off, you know. I was reviewing singles by um, a lot of, about 20 singles for a, a young rock magazine. And I picked up this record. I was asking my nephews and friends what they thought of it, kids, you know, each single. And I picked this one up and played it. Had a kid with short hair, T-shirt, poor young. I thought, it's probably going to be another letdown, you know. And I played that record 20 times. I couldn't believe it, that someone was singing like that, you know. Because I, I felt England went into a very weird state where no one wanted to sing anymore. It was either, yo, 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 or, you know, yo, it was like weird anti-singing, you know. It's okay if someone's making a statement, like the Sex Pistols, which I thought were great. You know what I mean? I might be contradicting myself here, but for some reason they were, at the time they came out, they were real, you know. They, they really politically meant what they said, and they really meant it, and it worked purely on that level. But, you know, basically, I thought it had gone into a big anti-singing period. And I was so pleased when I heard that, the poor young single and the John Waits, you know. Brilliant. Traffic merged R&B, jazz, rock and other styles. How did that come about? Ah, oh, um, Steve and Dave, Chris Wood. Chris Wood was heavily into folk. He brought uh, John Barleycorn Must Die into the house one day. We had, he had a, a record of the Watersons, an old English folk group. Their cousins and, and stuff. They sing in pubs, a cappella, no, no voices. And he brought this record in one day, you know, put it on. And it's incredible, you know. There were three men come out of the West, their fortunes fall to try, you know. And we said, what is that? You know, that's strange. <laughs> And he said, oh, it's a brilliant album, you know, ritual, magical folk songs. So, you know, and then Dave and me were heavily into writing, because Dave and I wrote uh, songs in deep feeling. Steve had got into writing through Spencer, but not heavily. Jackie Edwards wrote all the Spencer Davis hits. Keep on running, somebody help me, when I come home. And they branched into writing when they got into Give Me Some Lovin'. Which was a song they kind of they kind of borrowed the bass line from a Homer Banks classic R and B record in America. Dun 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 dun. But it was a nice piece of writing. The the, the lyric and the, and, the, and the thing was good. But Dave and I were more, I guess, progressive writers. And Steve was very steeped in jazz and R and B because he had a big influence from Ray Charles and Spencer Davis was mainly. Steve sounding like a black R&B singer, you know. I mean, Gimme Some Loving went to number one in America in the soul charts before they realized it was a 16-year-old white kid from Birmingham in England, you know. But um, the mixture of all that, you know, with Chris and Steve and Dave and myself, we had it just all about covered, you know. We had every kind of influence there was, you know. And also, we had such large um, appreciation there wasn't any of us that sort of said, oh, I don't like that kind of music, no, you, know, you know, and didn't give anything a chance and had very strong attitudes, you know. We were open to just about anything, you know. Hence, you got stuff like Hole in My Shoe compared to, like, um, Low Spark of High Heel Boys. You couldn't get more far apart, you know. I've played with a few, sweetie. Can I have a drink? Can we edit this? What musicians have you seen or played with and admired? Oh, God. The list never ends. Oh, um, Jimi Hendrix has got to be top of the list. I used to play a lot with him in a club in Margaret Street, back of Oxford Street, which is now called Bootleggers. It was called the Speakeasy then. And we used to jam in there regularly. 
Um, and he always managed to have a wow-wow pedal somewhere. He'd go out, he'd get it, you know, and he was always ready for a jam, which was, that was fantastic. Um, we played with oh, everybody. The Who, did the first British tour with The Who. Traffic, The Who, The Herd, which is Peter Frampton in The Herd. Um, we had a, um, a long, a long uh, history of working with the Grateful Dead. Uh, in San Francisco, we played for the KSAN Radio Benefit concert in 67, first trip to San Francisco, on the back of a truck in a railway yard. We jammed all afternoon, you know, and we got to know everybody, Jerry Garcia and people. And uh, classic people. We, we did a gig once with the Staple Singers. Now, I couldn't believe that they were backing us up. It was in New York, because we'd been listening to all the early Staples Singers albums. As I was saying, Traffic's influences were really wide and varied. And the Staples Singers were like Bible for us, you know what I mean? They were like Mavis Staple and Pop Staples. They were unbelievable, you know. And I felt really weird that they were, they were second on, the, you know, they were backing us up in New York. So we, we just trooped into the dressing room and sort of paid homage, you know, and said, Wow, you know, you're one of our... <laughs> yeah, we, we, I've had some great experiences playing with people. Carlos Santana used to come and jam when we were on the West Coast. Had some really good jams. There was a lot of jamming then. A lot of people played together. That seems to have died, doesn't it? It really does, doesn't it? I mean, I can't remember something like Duran Duran jamming with Spandau Ballet or you know, maybe Boy George coming in on tambourine. Or... It would be nice, though, you know, if... if they got more together, don't you think? I think the great thing of that period was you weren't so much in competition with each other. You were really in, 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 in one thing together. It was fantastic. And you were, you were actually complementing each other all the time and and really being knocked out with what someone did and being influenced and saying, oh, you know, that's fantastic and you, you want to do good yourself and you want to... And I think that's because maybe the bands had control then, you know. I think now the record companies and the big selling marketing, it's all, you know, marketing and... Has he got the video? How much have they spent? Two million dollars? It must be a piece of shit, you know. It's like... Uh, and then you're all divided off and actually there's a lot of kind of, it creates a sort of kind of bitchiness now, isn't it? It's a, instead of being together, you know. Is there anyone that you would really like to play with you haven't had a chance to? Um, Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> play drums for Jerry Lee Lewis for maybe one set. <laughs> uh, someone like that, you know. Um, I played with Sarah um, Ella Fitzgerald once. That was bizarre. I, mean, I never knew how that came about. It was a really strange session in Morgan Studios in Barnes, near Hammersmith. And the guy ran off and never paid anybody. It was a really weird session. Yeah, there's loads of people I love to play with. God, you know. Um, I'd really like to play with Sting. When I saw the video, Around the World video, and he was jamming with some guys in Japan, I thought that was so nice. You see what I mean about police? They, they got that same thing that relates to, you know... I don't know if you saw the video. He was jamming away with some Japanese guy, and it was great, you know. So they're a band that you admire? Very much. Very, very much. I'm... I'm, I'm always looking for... Um, you know, some time back when we, we, the band was together, you were, you were not only knocked out by things, you were really inspired by hearing the first time I heard Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys. I mean, that was like 20 years ahead of its time, you know, maybe 30 years or more. And that just inspired me so much, you know, it sort of really... I think um, that's the good thing, you know, to, to, to have a lot of people creating music for the right reasons, you know, rather than as a visual package. 
more to uh, inspire. This show is about the progressive rock scene, highlighting bands such as Jethro Tull, Genesis, Emerson Lake and Palmer, Yes and King Crimson. Do you feel traffic was an influence on any of these bands? Yeah, you know, I think, um, well, Jethro Tull, you know, came out just about the same time as we did. We, we did the first free concert in Hyde Park, traffic, ever. You know, free concerts we'd never heard of then. And Jethro Tull did it with us, or did the next one. But uh, Jethro Tull was very good too. I never, I, as far as taste went, it was never quite my, um, not quite my complete taste. It's very, very good. I and mean, the band was, Clive Bunker, the drummer, was great. Um, but I think, uh, what was the 